About a year ago, May 27th, 2022, I was tossing and turning, unable to sleep before a 4 a.m. interview with CNN International. We just released a groundbreaking report on Russia's atrocities in Ukraine with a group of experts from around the world. We got to work as soon as the world bore witness to the horrors of the Bucha massacre in early April. The hard part in the weeks leading up to the release was over, and I was about to be given a few minutes on a global platform to present our findings and even send a message to Vladimir Putin and his allies. And as an international human rights lawyer, in a world where there's minimal, if any, opportunities to bring perpetrators of international crimes to court, here was my chance to make the case in the court of public opinion, the next best thing. And Yona, as I was looking for the report, and your report points this out, the main purpose, of course, of the Genocide Convention is prevention. And that includes the responsibility of all 152 countries, I believe, who are signatory to this, including Russia, to intervene. So what legal action can be taken here, given Russia's veto power at the Security Council? Now, what this means for states is there's a legal obligation to prevent and to act and do everything reasonably in their power and capacity to influence the situation in order to both protect the targeted group of Ukrainians, as well as to um, respond to Russia uh, with, with various measures. When I re-listen to the interview, I'm a little ashamed at the overly measured language I used. I could have gone after Putin and his cronies in more severe terms. I wonder what held me back. After all, I was taking this interview from the comfort of my living room in Montreal. About six weeks earlier, again just after the Bucha massacre, my friend Vladimir Karamurza, the prominent Russian opposition figure, historian, writer, and filmmaker, who was twice poisoned by Russia's security service, the FSB, was arrested just hours after confronting Putin's regime in an apartment in the center of Moscow, with an absolute clarity of conscience and without mincing any words. This morning, a Russian opposition politician taken into custody by Moscow police just hours after a CNN interview aired in which he was critical of Vladimir Putin. This regime that is in power in our country today, it's not just corrupt, it's not just kleptocratic, it's not just authoritarian. It is a regime of murderers, and it is important to, to say it out loud. And it, it, is, it, is, it is really tragic, frankly, I have no other word for this, that it took a large-scale war in the middle of Europe, which Vladimir Putin is now conducting against Ukraine, for uh, most Western leaders to finally open their eyes to the true nature of this regime. I have absolutely no doubt that the Putin regime will end over this war in Ukraine. doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. The two main questions are time and price. And by price, I do not mean monetary. I mean the price in human blood and in human lives, and it has already been horrendous. But the Putin regime will end over this, and there will be a democratic Russia after Putin. And I think one of the most important things that we all, both we here in Russia and you in the West, should be thinking about right now is about how to rebuild those bridges, how to reintegrate that post-Putin democratic Russia into the international community. Because when that moment comes, it will be too late to start thinking about it. We have to prepare for that future today. I'm your host, Yona Diamond, from the Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. And this podcast is about the individuals around the world risking it all for something bigger than themselves, for our shared future. If recent events have taught us anything, it's that what happens abroad affects us all. Pandemics, wars, nuclear threats, climate catastrophe, the existential crises at our doorsteps. To confront these challenges, we shouldn't hear out regimes who rule by force. We should listen to the voices of conviction. This podcast is about what we have collectively at stake. This is The Price of Conviction, Season 1, A Tale of Two Vladimirs. A quick note on terminology. There isn't a universally accepted definition of political prisoner, which is often used interchangeably with prisoner of conscience. When I use these terms, I mean those imprisoned for who they are, their beliefs, or their human rights work. The word political is used because these people are not jailed for any real crime, but for politically motivated reasons. That is, the reasons an authoritarian regime sees as necessary to remain in power. The term dissident, from the Latin to disagree or sit apart, refers to those who peacefully oppose or criticize their government because it's authoritarian, a term that's particularly important for Vladimir's story 
being a student of the Soviet dissident movement. And one thing to understand about how Russian political history works and how Russian political dynamics work, certainly in, in the modern era, is that there is a direct correlation between the domestic nature of the regime and the way it behaves abroad, the way it behaves outside of Russian borders. So domestic repression is inevitably followed sooner or later by external aggression. This is Vladimir in a 2017 interview with PBS's Frontline. And this is absolutely logical if you think about it. I mean, what's, what's the reason for expecting a government that violates the rights of its own people and that breaks its own laws? Why would you expect it to then abide by international norms and respect the interests of you know, other countries or international borders? So uh, as Putin grew bolder and bolder and consolidated his control domestically and, and as he basically saw no reaction from the international community over his crackdown on independence of the media, over his crackdown on parliament and his rigging of elections. And he thought, you know, as again, he could be forgiven for doing, why not go on? And why not do even more things? And, and I think those people, those political leaders in Western countries who had chosen to ignore, um, you know, the crackdown on independence of the media and the rigging of elections and the destruction of democratic institutions in Russia, they... Uh, woke up one day to see a violation of international borders in Europe, to see the first territorial annexation in Europe since the Second World War, which is what Putin did in Crimea in 2014. These are all directly linked. And I think had the international community and had the leaders of Western democracies taken a more principled stand earlier on in Putin's rule, instead of praising him and trying to engage him and be friendly with him, as he was destroying democracy in Russia, I think had they taken a more principled line earlier on, we would not be seeing the excesses uh, that we are seeing today, including violations of international borders. This interview is from 2017. Although Vladimir's insight into the correlation between domestic repression and war has played out during Putin's career and throughout history and around the world, underscoring the dangers of normalizing or overlooking what happens within a country like Russia. A former 16-year KGB agent, Putin rose to power on the heels of his relentless bombing campaign in Chechnya starting in 1999 that laid waste to the capital of Grozny. And Putin's dictatorial rule today didn't happen overnight, but has often been described as creeping authoritarianism. But it wasn't all completely destroyed at the beginning. He was very sly and using kind of a KGB technique. This is David Hoffman, longtime editor at the Washington Post. He didn't let on that this is where he was going. He, he at first fooled a lot of people in the West by declaring his support for modernization, the Western style modernization of the economy. And uh, people thought maybe he was just a technocrat. It took a while. And as domestic freedoms were slowly being eviscerated at home, Putin's regime continued committing atrocities against civilians with impunity. In 2008, he launched a war of aggression on Georgia. Since 2011, he's propped up an Assad regime in Syria that has massacred, starved, and even gassed its own population in a civil war that has unfathomably killed hundreds of thousands of civilians and displaced more than half the pre-war population of 22 million. In Syria, international investigations have found Russia directly responsible for bombing densely populated areas, markets, schools, and hospitals. In 2014, Russia seized Crimea and territories in the eastern Ukraine Donbass region, a war that's killed more than 14,000. And then... The months-long buildup of Russian troops on the border with Ukraine has turned now into an invasion. Ukraine under attack. Putin decided to invade Ukraine for no reason at all, other than to expand his empire and prevent Russians from ever seeing a fledgling democracy next door promising a better life. This one decision unleashed unthinkable loss of life and destruction, not only on an entire country, but also the tens of thousands of Russian soldiers sent to death as cannon fodder and disproportionately from poorer ethnic minority groups not to mention the global impact on the environment, food shortages, and potential nuclear war. 
In this line of work, I'm constantly thinking about how outrageous it is to accept living in a world in 2023 where a few powerful men can make decisions on a whim that are so disastrous and destructive to humanity and our planet. And I'm struck by how our media coverage is resigned to this reality, too deferential to authoritarians in their narratives. I wanted to see these countries from the ground up. I wanted to hear the perspective of people fighting for a better future. And so this podcast will bring you those visionary voices, that other side. And this season will bring you a more hopeful side of Russia we rarely hear about. Within weeks of the full-scale invasion, hundreds of thousands of Russians fled the country in an unprecedented exodus. But Vladimir Karamurza did the opposite. He went right back to Moscow to help lead the parallel fight within Russia, the movement for a peaceful democratic future, not only for Russia, but the wider region and entire world. But even Vladimir's closest friends and family find it hard to believe he'd return after two poisonings where he was given a 5% chance to live, after the long list of Putin's other opponents who've been assassinated, including Vladimir's closest friend, mentor, and opposition leader Boris Nemtsov in 2015. And amidst the most repressive and dangerous period in Russia's modern history to be a critic of the regime. I always fear for his life. This is Vladimir's wife, Yevgenia, bringing the dangers into even more direct focus. Honestly, when I say that he's now being held by the same people who tried to kill him twice, I mean literally. Here's Yelena Gordon, Vladimir's mother, on the BBC. The mother of jailed Kremlin critic Vladimir Karamoza has told the BBC his spirit is unbroken despite the 25-year prison sentence he was handed last month. And this 25-year sentence? That's the harshest ever handed to an activist or opposition figure in Putin's Russia. Mr. Karamurza, one of President Putin's most vocal critics, was convicted of a string of alleged crimes, including treason. His mother, Eleanor Gordon, who's been allowed to see him since the verdict, says that fearing for his safety last year, she begged him not to return to Russia. Vladimir must have known last year when he came back to Russia, and you must have known that he was putting himself in, in a lot of danger by returning to Russia as, as a big critic of Vladimir Putin and someone who was instrumental in pushing Western governments to introduce sanctions on, on corrupt officials. Did you try to stop him last year coming back? I did. I did, because it's a very painful topic for me as a mother. I cannot distance myself and see him as a political figure only. He's first and utmost a son for me, my son. And I begged him not to go back to Russia. He didn't promise. He said he promised to think about this. And as you say, the result of his thinking was negative. Has he expressed any regret to you that he returned? No, never. Never. I regret it very much. I, I can speak for myself. Yeah? And this is Vladimir's friend, Bill Browder, the New York Times bestselling author of Red Notice and Freezing Order, who spoke at an event with Vladimir in London and spent the evening with him just days before he returned to Moscow. Towards the end of his speech, he, he says something uh, quite dramatic, which is that he's on his way back to Moscow. And I was shocked when I heard it. And, and I think everybody in the audience was shocked. You know, here was the guy who had they already tried to kill twice. He's on his way back to Moscow. Bill proceeded to try and dissuade him over dinner. You know, you can't go back to Moscow. You know what will happen to you. And it wasn't the first conversation like this we ever had. I, I was trying to convince him not to go back to Moscow after he had been poisoned the first time, after a second time. And he never listened. But this was particularly a bad time because the war had started and Putin was now sanctioned and all over the world. His assets were frozen. Central bank assets were frozen. And I thought perhaps I could get through to him this time. but. You know, I made the argument that, you know, they would try to kill him. They would try to arrest him. I even said to him, you know, you're, you're, you're selfish. I'm going to have to, if you, if you get arrested, I'm going to have to spend all this time campaigning to get you out of jail. And nothing I said worked. And he said, Bill, this is bigger than, than you and me. I, I have to go back to Russia. I'm asking the Russian people to stand up to Putin. How can I do that if, if I'm too afraid to go back to my own country? And as we were going away, I thought to myself, this is probably the last good meal that Vladimir is going to have for a very long time. So I set out to discover how one person and his words alone can take on a dictator with a crime syndicate and all the powers of the state at his disposal. The army, judiciary, legislature, security service, assassination squads, propaganda machine, and the rest. 
someone who never looked back, knowing that freedom and democracy will soon prevail in Russia. And through Vladimir's story, we'll uncover the inherent limitless power within all of us to stand up. But before we get there, let's go back to the start. Vladimir Karamurza was born in Moscow on September 7, 1981. His father was one of the most prominent Russian independent journalists and mother an art historian. Vladimir is from a generation that was raised in an era of optimism, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, a period of opening up and democratic reforms, along with the possibility of a genuine multi-party system and a thriving civil society in Russia. Here's Vladimir in the 2017 Frontline interview. You know, I'm from the generation whose first really vivid and really conscious political memory was August 91, the Democratic Revolution in Russia. Those three days that ended the Soviet regime and that, you know, revolutionized our country in so many ways. And I remember those three days in August very well, though I was only 10 years old at the time. Uh, when something like this is happening in your country, you notice and you remember. And I think the lesson that I took from those events and that I know I'll have for the rest of my life is that however strong the dictatorship and the repression, if enough dedicated people are prepared to stand their ground and stand up for their for their liberty and their rights and their dignity, they will prevail, as we saw in August 91. The, the plotters of that attempted coup, the leadership of the Soviet Communist Party and the KGB had everything. I mean, they were the state. They had the whole apparatus, the whole machine of repression, the whole machine of propaganda, the, uh, the KGB, the police, the army, the tanks. Of course, they had the tanks, which they sent physically to occupy uh, the center of Moscow. And the people, Russians, Moscovites, who stood up against that coup had nothing except their dignity and, you know, and their determination to defend their rights and their freedoms. And they went out and stood in the streets of Moscow in front of the tanks for three days and three nights. And the tanks stopped and turned away. That's a very powerful lesson. In Moscow, the hammer and sickle is lured for the last time, and an era comes to an end. At just 19, Vladimir became an advisor to Boris Nemtsov, the opposition leader and former deputy prime minister, and remained his closest friend until Nemtsov's assassination in 2015. Boris Nemtsov was even projected to be president, but was instead openly gunned down right in front of the Kremlin in the heart of Moscow after being tailed by an FSB assassination squad for 10 months, and just days before he was slated to lead a protest against Putin's war in Ukraine then, the message behind the deliberate timing and location of his assassination for all to see couldn't be clearer. This is what happens when you clamor for a democratic, peaceful Russia. Since then, Vladimir has led successful efforts to name streets and public spaces in front of Russian embassies around the world after Nemtsov, in spite of the Kremlin's attempts to erase his memory and legacy. According to Vladimir, he wouldn't be who he is if it weren't for Nemtsov. This is personal for me. Boris Nemtsov was my closest friend. Um, he's godfather to my younger daughter, that's family in Russia. And, um, and I know that for so many people, this is, this is personal. And, and we're not going to forget, by the way. Uh, I, I, and I have no doubt that one day, those people who are behind his assassination, not just the perpetrators who have just been sentenced to prison, but also the organizers and the masterminds, those who organized and ordered this, that these people will face justice. Nemtsov's assassination was the turning point that may hold the key to understanding Vladimir's dedication and effectiveness in his advocacy. You can almost see he carries Nemtsov with him. In every interview or speech, that fierce laser focus in his eyes, driven by something so personal, beckoned by the call for justice for his closest friend. I've never come across someone like Vladimir whose strength of intellect is remarkably equaled by his moral character. He's got the charisma of a political leader, the clear speaking and writing skills of a seasoned journalist or lawyer, the mind of a scholar historian with what appears to be a photographic memory, seamlessly citing dates, laws, and quotes throughout his public appearances and writing, all propelled by a profound sense of morality. From my experience grabbing a beer with him after a day of advocacy, he's also very down to earth. 
He studied history at Cambridge University and has a deep understanding of Russia's own democratic history, even publishing a book on the missed opportunity by Russia's first parliament to form a lasting parliamentary government. As a journalist, he headed the DC Bureau of the Russian language TV station RTVI for nearly a decade, and later went on to write a regular column for the Washington Post. He was a candidate for the Russian parliament and served as deputy leader of the People's Freedom Party and as a longtime leader of Russia's democracy and human rights movement. He founded the Boris Nemtsov Foundation for Freedom and has advised leading human rights organizations, including our own, where he's a senior fellow. And he's taught at the University of Chicago. His wife, Evgenia, is not only leading the campaign to free Vladimir, but is also an advocacy coordinator for Free Russia Foundation and a translator for pro-democracy organizations. Vladimir was twice poisoned in Moscow in the span of less than two years, each time suffering multiple organ failures and week-long comas. Doctors told Evgenia he had a 5% chance of surviving. After his first poisoning in May 2015, he'd have to relearn basic motor functions over the next year. But within that same year, while recovering and walking with a cane, Vladimir was on a flight back to Moscow to continue his work. Then, in February 2017, he suffered the exact same symptoms and diagnosis of poisoning by an unknown substance. Just three months after Boris Nemtsov's murder, Vladimir was poisoned for the first time. Barely survived. This is Yevgenia. Continued his work. Was poisoned again in 2017 with the same outcome. There was a coma, multiple organ failure, a month spent on relearning how to walk and talk. And then he went back. Bellingcat, the international collective of researchers, investigators, and journalists, has conducted a series of extensive investigations into assassinations and poisonings of opposition figures and activists in Russia. These investigations identified an assassination squad within Russia's Federal Security Service as behind the poisonings of Vladimir and Alexei Navalny and Nemtsov's assassination. According to Vladimir, the most likely motive for his assassination attempts was not his activism in Russia, but his activism abroad for what are known as Magnitsky sanctions. In the frontline interview, when asked about what Putin's most afraid of, Vladimir described two things. The first may be obvious, but the second is perhaps less expected. So the two biggest fears, biggest nightmares of the Putin regime are mass protests on the streets of Russia mass protests by the people of Russia against his regime, which we're increasingly seeing again since the beginning of this year, and I think we'll see only more of in the coming months and years. And the second one is those targeted personal individual sanctions against crooks and human rights abusers in Putin regime. Personal, this is very important. Not sanctions on Russia. An entire country should not be blamed for the actions of a small, unelected group of people in the Kremlin. Responsibility should be assigned where it is due to those people who actually perpetrate these abuses. And this is why the Magnitsky Act was so groundbreaking. It introduced this concept that you can sanction not a whole country, not even the government of that country, but you can actually sanction those specific people who are engaged in those abuses and in that corruption and in those human rights violations. Uh, and that was very honorable and principled as well as very effective. Magnitsky sanctions, named after the late Russian tax lawyer Sergei Magnitsky, in 2008, Sergei uncovered and testified to the largest tax fraud in Russian history, a scheme perpetrated by senior officials who stole $230 million from the Russian treasury. For nearly a year, the authorities tried, without success, to torture him into retracting his testimony. They held him in inhumane freezing prison conditions with overflowing sewage and maggot-infested food where he lost around 40 pounds, developed acute pancreatitis and gallstones, and was denied medical treatment as he suffered an agonizing pain. Eventually, after falling into septic shock, eight guards beat Sergei to death. Sergei discovered the fraud while representing Bill Browder, the CEO of Hermitage Capital Management, and Vladimir's friend mentioned earlier, who in the late 90s and early 2000s ran the largest foreign investment firm in Russia. When Bill quickly realized he wouldn't see any justice for Sergei's murder in Russia, he went to Washington, D.C. to get Congress to pass a law in his name that would impose targeted sanctions on individuals responsible for his death or other serious human rights abuse, 
freezing their assets, and banning them from entry or doing business in the U.S. The law was later expanded to target any foreign individual or entity responsible for human rights abuse or corruption. Bills made it his life's mission to see to it that countries worldwide pass and implement their own Magnitsky laws. And today, there are already 35 countries and counting with such laws on the books. My name is Bill Browder. I'm the head of the Global Magnitsky Justice Campaign. And Vladimir Karamurza, he was central to the Magnitsky campaign. If he wasn't involved, I seriously doubt whether we would have succeeded in a number of these countries. And here's how it started. Well, after Sergei Magnitsky was killed, I came up with this idea, which is to freeze the assets and ban the visas of the people who killed him. And I got this um, idea to Washington, and I got I, I was able to convince uh, Senator Benjamin Cardin, uh, who's a Democrat from Maryland, and uh, John McCain, a Republican from Arizona, to propose the Magnitsky Act. And Vladimir was one of the first people to come forward saying, this is genius. This is exactly what we need. This is this is what the Russian people need is a Magnitsky Act to go after the crooks and criminals who have been destroying the lives of Russia. And so he, independently from me, started to campaign for the Magnitsky Act. He and Boris Nemtsov. Boris Nemtsov uh, joined that campaign at the very beginning, and Vladimir was working uh, with him until um, Boris Nemtsov's murder in 2015, we believe largely in response to that campaign for the introduction of Magnitsky sanctions. They sort of went on on trips to Washington and met with members of Congress totally independently from me. I didn't, never asked him to do it, never, never had any kind of communications with him at the very beginning. And then we met. And I thought, wow, this guy is amazing. He was He's truly articulate and, and persuasive in such a, a compelling way. And then we started to travel together to parliaments, not just to the U.S., but to um, Canadian parliament and the European parliament and French parliament and Swedish parliament and all over the world. I would tell the story of Sergei, and then Vladimir would tell the story of how this would is it was helpful to the Russian population, that the Russian people wanted this. And that really worked well. And we became joint campaigners. And when we first met, he was in his early 30s, but he spoke with an air of authority and a sense of moral conviction. It was like Nelson Mandela or Vaclav Havel. I mean, just such an impressive person. And and I said to myself, this guy is going to do amazing things. I wanted to work with him, be around him, support him. And, and of course, I really valued the support he gave me and the Magnitsky family in this campaign. And Boris Nemtsov was equally instrumental. Boris Nemtsov had come to Canada uh, shortly after I tabled my private members' uh, bill for Magnitsky legislation and held a joint press conference with me to support the legislation and came back a year later and did the same and also uh, promoted Magnitsky legislation and was largely responsible for it being adopted along with Bill Browder in the United States and elsewhere. This is Professor Erwin Kotler, chair of the Wallenberg Center, former Attorney General and Justice Minister of Canada, and human rights lawyer who's internationally renowned for his defense of political prisoners throughout his life, going back to Nelson Mandela and beyond. Professor Kotler, or Prof, as students of his groundbreaking work, like myself, call him, introduced the Magnitsky Act in Canada and has become a leading advocate for its adoption, expansion, and implementation worldwide. Vladimir often quotes Prof, a close friend, as the authority on political prisoner advocacy. And Prof, in turn, has been appointed as special envoy to Vladimir's case by the Parliamentary Forum for Democracy. Boris Nemtsov said when Putin would argue against this legislation, he would say, Nemtsov, that this was the most pro-Russian legislation because it was legislation on behalf of the Russian people. It was legislation to hold human rights violators in Russia accountable. And it was to ensure that countries like Canada could protect our own uh, security, our own e economy from those human rights violators who, as I said, would seek to launder uh, their assets here, or not only launder their assets, but who would, in fact, you know, continue to operate uh, with impunity in Canada and elsewhere. Now, this has become an international movement, and that's why we speak today about sanctioning the major human rights violators. Prof also fell violently ill in a suspected poisoning in Moscow 
where he started throwing up blood and was hospitalized while traveling with a Canadian delegation in 2006. And he's been blacklisted from visiting the country since 2014. And like Vladimir, Bill also explained why Putin so fears the Magnitsky Act. So the Magnitsky case was something that uh, really upsets Vladimir Putin for several reasons. The, the first is that Sergei Magnitsky discovered a $230 million crime committed against the Russian government, and he exposed it. And it turns out that some of that $230 million that was stolen can be traced to Vladimir Putin. So Putin was a personal beneficiary of this crime. And so as Sergei exposed it, he, he was then arrested, tortured, and killed. And so as I went around the world trying to get justice for Sergei, I was effectively trying to, trying to punish Putin's co-conspirators. And so when, when we finally got the Magnitsky Act, it hits Putin right where it counts because he's a guy who commits crimes and then steals money. And it hits Putin psychologically where it counts because he was, I, I'm going after him and his criminal group. And so the Magnitsky case has been one which you can see how mad he gets every time people bring up the name Magnitsky. He, um, he made it his single largest foreign policy priority to try to repeal the Magnitsky Act. He spent an enormous amount of resources trying to stop the Magnitsky Act. He spent an enormous amount of resources trying to discredit Sergei Magnitsky and me. And beyond trying to discredit them, the Putin regime has even convicted and opened a number of criminal cases against Bill. On politically motivated charges, I'm the first. There have been a few other foreigners convicted. But uh, I, I've been convicted and sentenced in absentia twice. If I were to return to Russia, I, I would serve 18 years in a work camp or a, a hard labor. And there's, they're currently conducting another criminal case against me in which they're accusing me of murdering Sergei Magnitsky. After 10 years of claiming that he hadn't been murdered, but he had died of natural causes, when our campaign started to become too much for Putin, he then accused me of killing Sergei, along with a number of other people. So there's multiple murder cases open up against me in Russia. Everything about this really uh, gets under Putin's skin. And we know this was extremely valuable because we can see now the various offshoots of the Magnitsky Act you know, being used widely against Russia, freezing the assets and banning the visas. This was the Magnitsky technology now has been cloned and repeated and, and rolled out in all sorts of different ways. But Magnitsky, from Putin's perspective, was the original sin. This was the thing that started the whole ball rolling. This was the this was the um, thing that has snowballed into literally thousands of people, thousands of Russians being sanctioned in the Putin regime. And according to Vladimir's wife, Yevgenia, this was the main reason the Putin regime went after Vladimir with the harshest possible sentence. I think the main reason is that he was indeed instrumental in the adoption of the Magnitsky legislation all over the world. These people see my husband as their personal enemy who fought for years to bring them to justice who fought for years to have their assets, that money that they had stolen from the Russian population, and that they had um, hidden in the West, in using Western banking systems, to have that money frozen, to have them banned from ever being able to go to those countries to enjoy the privileges offered by Western democracies. So they see him as their personal enemy because he threatened what they hold the dearest, the money the billions and the billions of dollars that they've stolen from the Russian population over the years. Yevgenia told me how easy it is to get thrown in prison for criticizing the war, but Vladimir represents something even bigger. In Russia, you don't really need to do much to provoke the wrath of the repressive machine. Honestly, you can go and stand in the street with a copy of Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace, and you can get up to 10 years for that, for spreading fake news or discrediting the Russian army. You can uh, draw an anti-war picture like Masha Moskalova did at, at school, and your father is going to be thrown in prison for raising you in the wrong way. You can uh, make a, a one online post about the bombing of the theater in Mariupol, uh, like Marina, uh, Maria Ponomarenka, a journalist, Russian journalist, did, and uh, then undergo uh, a forced psychiatric so-called treatment 
at a hospital and then be sentenced to many years um, of prison for, for doing that. So they don't need much to persecute people. I think that this um, mind-boggling sentence, the presence of three people under Magnitsky sanctions and Vladimir's case, the fact that when asking for this uh, 25-year prison sentence, Prosecutor Loktyanov said, this is our enemy who must be punished when he talked about Vladimir. So all of this combined makes me think that this is a cynical act of revenge by those people who have been very much affected by Vladimir's activities over the years and by his refusal to back down, by his refusal to be intimidated, basically for refusing to die when they wanted him to. In fact, some of the very same regime officials implicated in Sergei Magnitsky's murder are responsible for Vladimir's conviction and prison conditions today. These people have been violating the rights not just of Vladimir, but of other Russian citizens as well. For example, a judge, Peter Prigorov, who's been sanctioned by many countries, and he's actually been sanctioned by the UK a few years ago in connection uh, to his involvement in the death of Sergei Magnitsky. So that person who sent Sergei Magnitsky to detention in 2008, tried my husband for treason in 2023, for high treason. Another such person is Dmitry Komnov. uh, He was the head of the pretrial detention where Sergei Magnitsky was held in 2009. He ordered torture on Sergei Magnitsky and then denied him medical care, as a result of which Sergei died. After Vladimir's arrest, he became the head of Moscow's fifth pretrial detention center where Vladimir's been held. The same person who is implicated in the death of Sergei Magnitsky in 2009 is committing the same types of crimes in 2023 by keeping my husband in pretrial detention unlawfully, uh, by depriving him of his right to talk to his kids, by keeping him incarcerated despite the fact that he has polyneuropathy, which is on the list of medical conditions that should prevent incarceration under the Russian law. Vladimir's health is already seriously deteriorating in just over a year of pretrial detention, including some time in solitary confinement in Moscow. But his situation will become even more desperate if he's transferred to a remote strict regime penal colony in the coming months, without the chance for proper medical treatment. The transfer process itself is rife with uncertainty and danger, where others have recently gone missing for weeks during their transfers in remote regions outside of public view at the mercy of their oppressors. This is why Vladimir needs our attention and pressure now especially to prevent that transfer and so that he might be released on medical grounds. He has uh, polyneuropathy symptoms that first were brought by the poisonings have not only come back now but seem to be spreading so he's losing feeling in both his feet now and his left hand uh, he's lost around 50 pounds and polyneuropathy is uh, a medical condition that can lead to paralysis if left untreated uh, and I know that uh, the diagnosis was given to Vladimir uh, by the medics who took upon themselves a great risk by giving him this diagnosis because Uh, This diagnosis is on the list of medical conditions that, uh, under Russian law, prevent the authorities, should prevent the authorities from keeping anyone incarcerated. And that diagnosis was then confirmed at a civilian hospital. And yet they still sentenced him to 25 years of strict regime. Vladimir is still being held at Moscow's fifth pretrial detention center until... um, Uh, The appeal is uh, considered and obviously rejected, and then he'll be transferred to the strict regime prison colony or prison or whatever. whatever. Um, So the fact remains that he does have a medical condition uh, that uh, cannot be adequately treated in the environment of pretrial detention center, or let alone strict regime. Vladimir is a proud heir to the Soviet dissident movement. The chosen title for his last documentary, My Duty to Not Stay Silent, best captures the life's credo of both the film's director and subject alike. 
Father Georgi Edelstein, who dedicated his life to maintaining a separation of church and state in the Soviet Union and Russia, and to always speaking one's conscience. The Russian author Leo Tolstoy, who was also one of the most influential figures in the peace movement of the 19th and 20th centuries, wrote in War and Peace that, quote, if everyone fought for their own convictions, there would be no war, unquote. And in this, Vladimir is living and carrying on the highest ideals of Russian tradition and culture. When Vladimir speaks, he not only believes in his words, but knows them to be true. And this is the conviction that can lead us into a future that transcends war and repression. And when we give regime officials more attention and protection than the true leaders, the voices of conviction, we do so at our own peril. For more information, go to priceofconviction.com. A special thanks to my colleagues at the Wallenberg Center for making this podcast a reality, and to all our guests, especially Evgenia Karamurza, for her generous participation, and to Kayla Diamond for the original music. If you like the show, please leave us a review, and stay tuned for episode two next week, The Trial. <laughs>